Praise the Lord, Mount Zion family. Come on, praise the Lord, Mount Zion family. The Bible says that God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all you can ask, think, or imagine. And so we're going to lift up this song today that says, God, you are able to do it. God, you are able to do it. God, we believe you can do it. God, we've seen you do it. God, we know you can do it again. And so we meet our faith, Lord God, with your expectation, Jesus. Hallelujah, oh God. So God is able to do just what he said he would do. He's going to fulfill every promise you. So don't give up on God, because he won't give up on you. Say, come on, put your hands together with us. Come on. Hallelujah, Jesus. We believe your word. We stand on your word. Come on, say, God is able. God is able to do just what he says. Just what he said. He He's gonna fulfill He's gonna every fulfill single promise to you. Jesus. How many believe it? We're going to take it up one time right here. Say, oh God. God is able to do just what he said. Just what he said he He's not a man that he shall lie. He's going to fulfill gonna every single promise. Every promise to so don't give up Take it out right here to this victory chant and this war cry. Come lift it up with us. Say, oh.
won't give up on you, God, because you never, ever gave up on us. So don't give up on God, because he won't give up on you, because he's a Well, thank you so much for tuning in today to the Mount Zion Church here in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm Bishop Joseph Warren Walker III, and we're grateful to have you connected to our Bible study this week. We believe God's going to do something powerful in your life. We don't take it for granted that you tune in every week, and we appreciate you so much. Listen, God has a word for your life. I cannot wait to get it to you. We're in this series, Winning at Warfare, Five Battles Christians Face. It's going to bless you. Listen, I want you to stay connected to us wherever you're watching. Follow me. Joseph Walker Three. follow my wife, Dr. Steph Walker. We want to connect with you. Hit me up on Instagram, Twitter, Periscope. Follow her out there on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We just want to stay connected with you. We appreciate you so much. Now we're going to give. Let's do it. God is amazing. We have this opportunity to, to give, and uh, I want to thank God for each one of you as you continue to sow into this good ground. And, of course, you can text to give. That information is on the screen right now. Make sure you text. Um, it's an easy way to engage every week, every time you have an opportunity to give. Do that. If you want to mail your offering in, make sure you do it. Here's a, this is how you do it. Mail it in to Mount Zion Baptist Church, Attention Finance Department, 7594 Old Hickory Boulevard, Whites Creek, Tennessee, uh, 37189. Thank God for you. So, Father, we thank you right now for the privilege to uh, give. We thank you for the word. We're ready now to receive. Speak in our hearts now in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. Well, we're going to go at this word today. We are going to have the battle of family. Now, guys, let's just be real. It is so important for us to understand how the enemy attacks our family relationships, attacks our brothers and sisters. And, man, I think it's important to understand this warfare here it's the core issue of what we deal with. Many of you have tensions and stress in your family and don't understand where it comes from. But look at Proverbs 17 and 17 for a second. Look at this. It says, a friend loves at all times. And a brother is born for adversity. Now, as you think about that for a second, I want you to understand family is really at the center of God's plan for for the happiness and progress of God's children. And the Bible teaches us that God established family at the beginning. Before God does anything, he establishes the family unit because God cares about family. In the midst of that, of our cozy homes now, it's easy to forget that we're at war. The devil is attacking families left and right. We're seeing domestic violence on the rise. We're seeing a divorce rate increase. God's word in Ephesians 6 and 12 reminds us that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts and the wickedness in heavenly places. You see, the enemy has a crafty way of making you believe that family is not worth fighting for. We strengthen so much, yet it's so easy to not strengthen our family. We'll fight for anything, man. But we'll roll over when it comes to our family. And there's so much that we can be dismayed about in the view of the state of marriage and how many marriages are breaking up in our country and in this media climate that family is not always easy. I get that. Marriage takes work. Relationships take work. But you got to get to a place where you realize you'll never win this battle until you conclude that it's worth fighting for. Now you gotta remember that when we're called as soldiers of Christ, we're called to fight, we're called to fight. And how do you overcome family conflict? Because I know that some of you out there, you couldn't wait for this one because you got some cousins, <laughs> you got some brothers and sisters you hadn't spoken to, you got a lot of stuff going on in the family. And we all have seen conflict in family bonds. We've seen people speaking or arguing in family functions. We're like, oh, Lord, oh, why'd they come? 
the tensions, the secrets, the, all the stuff that runs through families can be incredibly interesting, right? But to handle that conflict, you got to be in the proper mindset that you got to understand what it means to have a proper relationship with Christ because if there is no proper vertical relationship with him, there could be no horizontal relationship with others. See, when you see how desperately you need God's grace, you have a sense of humility in your heart to offer grace and forgiveness to other people around you. Because I recognize that if these relationships are going to matter and work, then I got to also experience a level of grace. Right? So I got to trade perspectives. See, so when I trade perspectives, I'm saying I must be willing to let go of my anger. Even though sometimes being angry feels like it's right. And sometimes you have some justifiable reasons to be angry. I mean, it's okay. But don't let their sin surprise you. Expect sinners to act like sinners. Even wise and obedient and mature Christians sin. So don't be caught off guard because somebody in the family did something crazy or your husband did something crazy or your wife did something crazy. Just say, you know what? That's what sinners do. But hurting actions come from hurting people. It's not so much easier to keep from getting angry when we recognize the humanity of behind hurtful actions or comments. Get to the root. Don't just judge the behavior. Get to the source. <laughs> That's why when you do that, Colossians 3 and 14 says, above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Woo. See, one of the things I've shared with a lot of folks, shared this on my podcast recently, don't react, respond. Man, think about it, right? It takes a deep change in your heart to give up taking offense. When you've been offended by a relationship, your natural response is, it's on. You know, you got that, that sealing thing. What you did to me, I'm going to do to you. <laughs> but, but you got to take your hurt to God, man. Receive a perspective shift that allows the process of healing and forgiveness to take place in your life. Put yourself second and love the person whose comments or actions hurt you. Can you do that? Can you do what Jesus did from the cross and say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do? Are you mature enough to respond in a way that puts their actions, right? Puts their needs, rather, ahead of their actions? See, silence and the Holy Spirit can convict you more loudly than words. I've just learned sometimes to just sit back and say, Lord Jesus, what, what now? And the Holy Spirit's convicted me and I've had a different response to being offended because see, when offense comes, your, your spirit of retaliation kicks in. But, but you've got to learn sometimes it's just best to just take that offense to God in prayer. Say, Lord, I turn this over to you. Some of you be in jail right now had you not done that. <laughs> Don't let it grow, man. Don't let this stuff grow. We allow hurt and pain and offense to grow in our hearts, grudges and bitterness, and that's why you got family members who haven't spoken to each other for years because you don't want to confront it. You don't want to deal with it. You just keep passing like ships in the night. That's why when a husband and a wife has their argument, they stop talking, and it could be weeks in the house. They just walk by each other until somebody breaks the ice, right? It only hurts us. It damages us more when we don't address it. We don't deal with it. We just kind of avoid it. You gotta take this stuff to God at all times. Because see, oftentimes our conflict with our family grows because we're trying to stand up for ourselves. You know, we're like, I got this. Rather than just say, Lord, I'm gonna let you stand up through me. <laughs> then number four is, can you think less of yourself and more highly of others? And think about that. Philippians 2 and 3 is not my word. Philippians 2 and 3 says it. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Woo, hallelujah. Did y'all see that? 
It's an example of Christ, man. That Christ expected to be rejected, abused, but responded uprightly every single time. Matthew 16 and 24 says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, follow me. See, can you focus on your witness and not your way? Can you get to a place where it's not about sometimes your way, but just focus on the witness? Somebody asked me, what's the secret to, to staying married? I said, you got to decide whether you're going to be right or whether you're going to be married. <laughs> In John 13 and 35, but this all will know. By this all will know that you are my disciples. If you love, if you have love for one another, man. If you have this unconditional love for your brothers, understand that God loves all people in the conflict equally. See, I know you like, God can't love you the way you treat me. You're so mean and you're so nasty to me. And you think that God is a respected person. God loves you. When you were mean and nasty in a different situation, see, God's desires for us all to come into the life-giving salvation that Jesus provided on the cross. He didn't die for some of us. He died for all of us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me, he, he died for all of us, the least, the last, the left out. He died for us while we were yet sinners. Even if you are the only one saved in your family, the only one that seems to be walking by faith right now, God does not love you more or believe that you should get your way because you are a Christian. God loves them too. God is long-suffering, willing that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. Your entitlement does not work in church nor out of church. So ask yourself, is this issue at hand more important than anybody's salvation? Ask yourself that question, man. See, because if you have unsaved family members, how do you deal with that? How you deal with that hurt and conflict may be the greatest witness you have. Because how God asks us to live humbly and gentle in the world is so countercultural. People don't understand that. People think fight before they think stand down. They think anger before they think love. See, here are four ways we fight for our families. I want you to take out a pen. and I want you to write this out. Listen carefully. You got to stand firm. Standing firm. Our posture should be one of retreat, right? Knowing that we've been given everything we need, right? Everything we need to withstand the attack. The problem is knowing that we're warfare, so I got to stand firm. After having done all, stand. That's what it says. When I put on the whole armor of God, after having done all, I stand. See, is there an aspect in your marriage where you've given up because you say, what's the use? Is there an issue which you've concluded? That's just the way it is. Rather than just giving up, stand firm on the Lord's truth. Your word does not return unto you void, but it accomplishes what you sent to do, God. So I'm standing on this promise. I'm standing on this promise that you are a deliverer, that you are a healer, so you can heal this broken relationship or you can deliver my family member for whatever they're dealing with. You can deliver them. Stop trying to disown dysfunction. Your family ain't the first. <laughs> now let me, you, you may think your family is the first family that's jacked up, but it's not. Everybody watching me right now got some dysfunction in their family. Look at the first family, Adam and Eve. Y'all see this? Eve tricked her husband, Adam, into disobeying God. Their child, Cain, killed the brother Abel. And Cain ran away to avoid persecution. Talk about dysfunction. Isaac's family, Jacob, one of the twin boys, swindled Esau, the other twin, out of his birthright by lying to the father to help, with the help of their dysfunctional mother, Rebecca, Esau wants to kill his brother, Jacob, 
went to live with his uncle Laban who tricked him into marrying his daughter Leah. Talk about dysfunction. Jacob had 12 sons, decided, right, by his younger, you know, decided uh, uh, by, by the youngest with the coat that, 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 that didn't sit well. They were hated by him. They hated Joseph, right? The 12 sons hated Joseph, decided to throw him in a hole, sold him into slavery, told their father, the animal that killed him, are you kidding me? And you think your family jacked up? All of us got some stories, man. All of us got some stuff like, man, back then that happened, back then that's happened. But see, people of God, that's why you got to walk in faith. If you're going to fight for your family, if you're going to win this battle, you got to walk in faith because when you see the realities of our marriages and families, there's a temptation to walk by sight. You get caught up in these reality shows, but you got to walk by faith, man. See, the path weakens our resolve and leads us to discouragement, right? Because sometimes we, 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 <laughs> by what we see out there, man, it can be so frustrating. But faith is what gives us the fight. See, I'm talking to somebody now, you're just exhausted. You've been trying to make it work. You've been trying to, you're like, Bishop, I've just been trying to go to counseling. I've been trying to do this and I'm just tired. But you got to have faith to keep on fighting, man. Your family matters because if God can work a miracle in regenerating your heart, then God can work in your family as well. I have a question for you. If you were in the hospital and the doctor gave you a diagnosis and the prognosis were grim, you want everybody in this church to pray for you because you'll be believing God. I'm healed. God's going to heal me. Your child was in a situation, in an accident, in the hospital, you'd be like, God, you're going to raise my child up because I know what your word says. How is it we can believe God to do everything else but heal our families? When it comes to that, it's because we let flesh in, because we're like, I don't want it no more. I don't care what God wants me, but I don't want it no more. You see? That's why, man, you gotta understand the persevering in prayer. Because 1 John 5, 14 and 15, look at this. It says, now this is the confidence we have in him that if we ask anything, not some things, but anything according to his will, he hears us. And y'all, if he hears us, whatever we ask, we know we have the petitions of what we've already asked of him. My God, we know it. The enemy will use apathy as poison, making prayer feel useless. Now with you. No, 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 no. You understand the power of prayer. You understand that when you pray, you got to go with boldness. You know, I, I, you have no idea how many mothers have prayed for their daughters and prayed for their sons, prayed for their families. You have no idea, you know, how often I've laid on my face and prayed for your family, prayed that it would not fail, prayed for your children, because I understand the power of prayer. The Bible says the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous avails much. When we pray, we believe something's going to happen. You got to know how to cover your family. Sometimes let everybody go to sleep and just walk around the house and just say, Father, the name of Jesus. Just cover. Just lay hands on your spouse when they go to bed. Because you got to declare, listen to me, that the curse stops with you. Ooh. Maybe you inherited a family curse. Maybe curse began with you. Either way, God has a plan for your freedom. It'll shatter the chains and the cycle forever. God wants to break every chain. You got to declare it's going to stop in my life so that I don't pass this down to my children's children. So I'm going to take the necessary steps practically and spiritually to stop this curse from coming in my life. In John chapter 8, verse 31 to 36, Jesus said, look at this, to those Jews who believe, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And they answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and we have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin and a slave does not abide in the house forever but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, whew, 
you shall be free indeed. Man, can you get that? Let, let's, let's look at the curse versus consequences. Let, let's, let's look at this for a second. Let, let's examine this. What that means, on one hand, if I am bondage to sin, the curse comes in, and then therefore, he says, I cannot abide in the house. Meaning because if I'm in this space, watch this, there are consequences. Unresolved sin leaves stains and curses in my bloodline. But I want to declare of your life today, you can recover your bloodline. I need somebody to shout, I shall recover my bloodline. See, a generational curse comes through the bloodline. Therefore, generational curses must be canceled by blood. See, when you go to your physician and you go for your annual physical, you fill out paperwork, and they start asking you a series of questions about your medical history and your family history because they understand from the medical perspective that if these things exist in your family bloodline, you probably have to be monitored that those things don't come into your life. High blood pressure and diabetes could potentially be a part of what you have to fight off. Same way, if alcoholism and teenage, all these different things, all these different things come into your bloodline. See, if you remember the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant was where once a year on a day of atonement, the priest would sprinkle the blood of animals. And the blood was a barrier between the animal, watch this, between the curse and the law, rather, and the people of the covenant. The blood always stood in the gap. Romans 3, 23 through 25, thank you, Holy Ghost, for all have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as appropriation by his blood through faith, right? Through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed. Walk in truth and it will set your bloodline free. When you walk in truth, it'll set your bloodline free. I, I, want, I want to just declare over somebody's life that God's about to cancel every generational curse in your life, in your family, because what's, what's happening with you? You know, it's like that situation with the father who brought his son to Jesus, and he discovered when Jesus said, how long has your son been doing this? He said, since a child, but if you could have mercy, have mercy on us, because he began to realize that Maybe my son's acting this way because of me. What is it in your life that you don't want to pass down to your children's children? It's extremely important to understand this, people of God. Jesus' death on the cross took the penalty and the power of sin away. And as a consequence, we realize that because I'm saved and filled with the Holy Spirit and because the blood covers my life, I am covered against any generational curse over my life. This deliverance can occur in anybody's life regardless of the iniquities because, I, you know, Romans 3.25, you know, it, it speaks to this. And I think that when you, when you really look at it, you know, just as salvation must be appropriated through faith, deliverance from generational iniquities and curses the same way, by faith. Because until you personally appropriate Jesus' sacrifice through faith, it's not effective in your life. And the curse can remain. How do you break the cycle? How do you deal with the cycle? My friend Jonathan Matt Reynolds has a song called Cycles. How do you, how you break it? Well, Ezekiel 18 and 4 says, Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. That's word there, y'all. Choose life and blessings. See, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 5 and 6, you shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, 
visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generations to those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keeping my commandments. Here we see how God visits the iniquities of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation. But notice the rest of the verse, it says that the blessing, that the blessing goes not only to the three and four generations, but to a thousand generations. The generational blessings are stronger than the generational curse. Let me say it again. The generational blessings are stronger than the generational curse. Let me say it again. The generational blessings are stronger than the generational curse. See, you got to find joy as a family. Let me show you how to do it real quickly. Watch it. Teach your children to follow Jesus. Boom. There it is. Teach your children to follow Jesus. Build this up in your house. Share the gospel. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. In Psalm 132 and 12, if your son keeps my covenant and my testimony, which I shall teach them, their son shall also sit upon the throne forevermore. Putting these values in your home are so important. The apostle Paul spoke about family relationships. He counseled children in Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment of promise that it may be well with you and your, you may live a long life on the earth. And you and your father and you, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Proverbs 13 and 1, watch this. A wise son heeds his father's instructions, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. The wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. Jeez. Proverbs 15 and 5. A fool, I'm giving you all this word because I want y'all to get it. A fool despises his father's instructions, but he who receives correction is prudent. In Proverbs 15 and 20, a wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish man despises his mother. Look at Exodus 20 and 12. Honor your father and mother and your days will be long upon the land which the Lord your God has given to you. So when you appreciate the days God has given to you and you show devotion and honoring the gifts of God, your mother and your father, you honor them. You don't wait until they are gone, come to the funeral and fall over in the casket. You honor them. Even if the relationship wasn't right, you still have to honor your mother and your father that your days will be long on the earth. Study the scriptures of the family. Spend time with your family in the Word of God, man. Create some creative ways to do it. I share these super book videos with my daughter, Giovanna. She loves them. They're telling Bible stories and she's learning the Word of God. You know, understand, man, whatever it takes to get the Word in your family, do it. Right? Deuteronomy 6, 6 and 7 says this. These are the words which I command you. Teach them diligently. They'll be in your heart. Walk in them. When you sit in your house, when you walk in your way, when you lie down, when you rise up, right? Because you got to read this word to your family, man. Help them. Take a moment out of the hectic day and say, let's focus in on what God's word says together before we start turning the TV on our favorite show and then serve your family. Serve your family. Don't allow your family to see you serving everybody else but never serving them. And never... You know, you, 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 you know, you're being nice and you're ushering and getting water for folk at church and won't get water for your spouse at home. You're on the prayer ministry at church and you're laying hands on everybody else but won't even pray in your own house. You know, you got to learn how to serve at home, right? Matthew 25 and 40 says, and the king will answer and say, but surely I said to you in so much as you did unto the least of these, my brother, when you did it unto me. Serve your family. Increase the love at home. Philemon raises the question, how is the church at your house? <laughs> right? In Mark chapter 10, verse 69, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, and they shall no longer be two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let nobody separate. Jesus cares so much about the family. God cares about the family. Right? 
that Jesus cares about his mother Mary, even on the cross. We see him ministering to his mother from the cross. Right? It's important. John 19, you know, verse 25, he stood at the cross, right? And his mother's sister and Mary, and the wife of Clophus, and Mary Magdalene. And Jesus therefore saw his mother and disciples whom he loved standing by. He said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciples, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciples took her to his own home. You see, people of God, listen, family is so critical. And when you fight for the family, it's an intentional effort to declare that no weapon formed against me or my family is going to prosper. All of us have issues and dysfunctions and struggles and challenges, but at the end of the day, when the deal go down and you out there by yourself, all you got is your family. You got to be willing to fight for that. And I want to thank you so much because I want to pray for you today. If there's some tension or issue or struggle in your family, let's, let's take authority over it now. Father, in Jesus' name, we take complete authority over every distraction, every, every dysfunction, every spirit of discouragement around our family for that spouse who's wondering should they continue to fight, for that child that feels unheard, for that parent that just doesn't know what to do. Heal families now. Thank you for restoration in our family unit. We give you glory. We give you praise. In Jesus' name. I want you now, if you need a relationship to come into the family of Jesus Christ, he loves you and he's waiting on you right now. I want you to make the best decision you can make in your life. I want you to email me now, salvation at mtzionnashville.org. If you want a church home, salvation, mtzionnashville.org. You need a cover, you want to come back. You're in the city for Nashville, you need a church by watch care, salvation mtzionnashville.org. I want you to connect now. Come on into the family of faith. Family is so important. Your natural family as well as your spiritual family. We thank God for you. And I praise God. We're going to conclude this series next week on part five. Got one for you. Talking about destiny. You don't want to miss that. So may the grace of God cover you. May he keep you. May he make his face shine upon you. And may he give you the spiritual fortitude to battle and win and fight for your family. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope you were blessed by today's Bible study. You know, we're very excited to bring this word into your life, particularly in this season where all of us are social distancing and attempting to uh, abide by what the CDC is asking us to do. But the word of God is so important in all of our lives. And what I want you to do is I want you to let me know if this message has blessed you, stay connected with me at Joseph Walker 3 on Instagram, my wife, Dr. Steph Walker. We love to connect with you. And also you have an opportunity right now to give haven't done that, please sow into what God is blessing you with. We want to be able to continue to reach more souls for Jesus Christ. You help us do that. Right here is the text to give information. Thank you so much for watching it and we can't wait to share another word with you.